Hello and welcome back to another episode of a podcast. Today I am joined by Jamie Cook, head of the RSA and a TEDx speaker. We are going to be talking about universal basic income, a topic which I think is really important given some changes we could potentially face in the next decade. So Jamie, thank you for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me on the show. It's fantastic to be here. So I think a really good place to start before looking into the future is something you touched upon in your TEDx talk. Um, how has the role, how has the welfare state changed from World War II up until now? I think that's a good place to give us an understanding of the current ball game we're, we're playing with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really for me, I think that's what first uh, opened up my interest in basic income. Um, mm -hmm. I must admit, when I first came across the concept, I, I didn't know anything about it. And I didn't really think it was, it was realistic, uh, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. But what it did seem as a starting point, I'm sure we'll discuss why maybe I've changed my, my thinking on that, but um, was because it was a really useful provocation and challenge to the system and the state we find ourselves in, in now. Uh, and as you, you rightly said there, we, we've been through huge changes, you know, mm. in that post-war period, we created a welfare state, largely with, with, you know, fairly broad political support across the spectrum that responded to, you know, the work of beverage and those giants that identified these huge problems that, that society faced. It recognised the, the, the imminent and, and all persuasive, pervasive nature of those giants and those challenges. And also, I suppose, recognise the shared sacrifice of the Second World War. It changed. Mm -hmm. Soldiers came back. People who'd been left at home wanted to see a, a new world out of the sacrifices they'd made. Uh, and that really set that scene for, you know, so many institutions were still incredibly rightly proud of, you know, the, the National Health Service, uh, looking across how we created a, a social security system that was there to be a, a safety net, you know, to protect people when they most needed it. But part of the problem was that that system was created in a world that's very different to the one we're in now. Mm -hmm. It was a world where the best rate out of poverty was work. You looked to, you know, leave school whenever that was and quite often get a job for life, whether that was through apprenticeships, you know, working in heavy industry. Not necessarily uh, safe jobs or jobs that were good for your health, but often jobs that you could spend an entire career in that had a stable income that did allow people to start to change their lives even if it wasn't directly for them, certainly for, for their children uh, and generations to follow them. Uh, and that really dominated uh, and was largely unchallenged for, for quite a few decades. Mm -hmm. but I suppose we started to see significant changes really in the 80s um, with the advent of, of Thatcherism here in the UK and, and the kind of wider changes in, in capitalism across um, Western, Western democracies and economies. And I think one of the things that really strikes me with, with those changes is largely they were never put to the public uh, as something to vote on. And what I mean by that is not so much the individual policies, but the attitudes and the environment that's been created around it. So that idea of a welfare state that was for everybody, we all participated, could benefit from when we needed it, that it was there to protect you at your weakest moments, became one where the presumption was people are scroungers, they're cheats, they mm -hmm. don't deserve the support. So we're going to make you jump through as many hoops as possible to prove that you absolutely have to, to receive this. Uh, and in many ways, although some of those discussions started uh, in the 80s, I think it's really over the last you know, decade or so that we've seen them uh, take on, a, a, frankly, a, a really kind of uh, disturbing aspect in terms of that move towards a system rooted in sanctions and punishments and making people jump through hoops mm -hmm. to receive quite meager um, support you know and when you look at the, the current system in the united kingdom of, of social security so universal credit which some people say to me you know surely that's a step towards a basic income it was introduced again largely with you know cross-party support mm -hmm. uh, as a way to streamline to bring together disparate benefits and, and give them in a, a single payment but the problem was that while there may have been some elements of, that were positive to that, they were very quickly lost in amongst the, the ideological elements that were added to it. So making people wait uh, a significant period of time, requiring you to demonstrate how much uh, work you're seeking or doing, uh, punishing you, the, the impact if you actually move into work of how much you lose in terms of the, the benefits taken away from you means that they have to have sanctions to force you into work because otherwise you wouldn't take the job. It wouldn't make economic sense. And it really is in that distrust and what mm -hmm. we're saying to people is we do not trust you when you come to us for support and that to me is a, a huge and fundamental change 
from that original system, flawed as it was in many ways, but that was still rooted in that. And alongside it, we still have this perception that, you know, work is the best route out of poverty. Well, unfortunately, as we've seen, and this was before the, the pandemic mm. uh, exacerbated many issues, you know, so much work for so many people is, is precarious. Um, you don't know how many hours you're going to have or whether it will be there in a month or two months or six months time. You know, we're certainly seeing, you know, stagnation and indeed reduction of, of, of wages uh, in real terms as inflation, you know, goes out of control. So we, we've seen a really negative position that we've come to, and yet the, the media and political environment has been to say that it's the fault of the people trying to claim those benefits rather than the system that's put it into that position. Yeah, interesting. What, at what point did you decide or did, you, did the idea come into your head that a UBI, a universal basic income, could potentially remedy and help solve some of these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I, I first got involved in that discussion in 2016. Um, yeah. So uh, certainly in Scotland at the time, it was very much a fringe concept. I mean, the, the Scottish Green Party have long, been long-term supporters, but it wasn't in mainstream political uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. There had been some Scottish economists, um, so uh, Annie Miller's long-standing uh, basic income uh, leader in Scotland, the late Ilsa Mackay, who was a, a Scottish feminist economist, had uh, been a very strong uh, and articulate proponent and, and laid a lot of the groundwork for, for where we are today by viewing it through a, a feminist uh, and gender lens. Um, but for me, as I said, colleagues at the RSA had, had published a first report exploring what basic income could look like for the United Kingdom as a whole. Uh, and we have an annual lecture in Scotland and I invited Guy Standing, Professor Guy Standing, to give that lecture on basic income. And, and Guy's a I joke in some ways he's kind of gateway drug for many people into basic income. I think, you know, his, his work, particularly this coining of the precariat as this new social class of precarious workers, I think is a very, um, it's a way that people can really engage with the concept quite quickly and, and open up into the, the wider world. Uh, and so I, I very much organised that as a way to, as I said earlier, provoke discussion around the feelings and the system that we have around us. But what really struck me were a couple of very quick things. One was the the, the appetite and the openness and indeed the need in Scotland for new thinking. So in Scotland, traditionally, we have, you know, a, a political environment that's broadly speaking centre left, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's traditionally kind of seen as more progressive or, or kind of um, in thinking. That's had decades of very well-meaning politicians trying to largely do the same well-meaning policies and yet we still have entrenched issues around health inequity and, and outcomes we have you know intergenerational unemployment we have poverty and social deprivation um, and so there was a feeling of we can't just keep trying the same thing even if it's well-meaning so there was an openness to new ideas that that really struck me that that something about basic income therefore captured that that innovative exciting need for for change I think going back to what we, we said earlier about trust, for me, that was one of the fundam fundamental issues and, and opportunities within it is that it's a system fundamentally based on the premise that we trust you. Mm -hmm. I trust you and myself and everybody else to receive a payment and to choose what to do with that. Uh, and I think that is such a, a powerful antidote to the environment that's being created that is really exciting. And, and I'm sure as we'll touch on, as you start to see what that's looked like when ideas like basic income have been tested in different places, people respond to that. If you yep. treat people with trust, they give that trust back to you. Uh, I've never really understood the kind of traditional dichotomy of you're either for the state or you're for individuals, because to mm -hmm. me, it's both. It's a mixture and a big mass of the two. And basic income is fundamentally a policy of both of those. You can't have it without being part of something bigger. It comes from being part of a society and a community and a bigger economy but it puts back the, um, the opportunities to you to, um, to make those choices, to give you that autonomy uh, around how you do it. So that really excited me as a policy and as an approach. Uh, and I think, you know, in, in the beginning with basic income, I, I very strongly felt that even if it didn't turn out to be the answer, it was making us ask the questions we needed to ask. And that mm -hmm. you know, felt a really powerful um, framing. But what I find over the last few years, as we've developed that, as we've carried out research in Scotland and explored some modeling around what a, a basic income could do, is you started to see it. Now, it's not some sort of utopian silver bullet that solves every problem. There's no doubting. There are versions of a basic income you could introduce that would be disastrous if yep. they were from a particular viewpoint. But the idea of a basic income of that, that fundamental security and trust as a foundation stone to 
the world and to society and to our economy that we build other policies on top of, that suddenly becomes a very coherent answer to rebuilding that social contract. So that fraying and attacking and undermining and, and lack of evolution of our social contract that we've, we've explored already, basic income for me is that foundation that we, we recreate that social contract for the 21st century. And that, more than any other policy I've explored, mm -hmm. really captured that, that foundational transformational aspect for me. Yeah, you talk a lot about distrust and people are very quick to write off a new concept like UBI, universal basic income. Which studies have you come across which you have found, I guess, the most compelling, which could perhaps persuade some people that there are enormous benefits to a scheme like UBI? Absolutely. I mean, so basic income is frustrating because, and it's, it's worth saying, I mean, it has it gets called many different things. I, I tend to call yeah. it basic income only because... Um, UBI and in terms of universal basic income within a, a UK context has become so associated with universal credit that it mm. kind of people think you're, you're talking about the same thing. But um, I, I think there's a few, some really, really fascinating examples um, of it. I think a couple come from Canada and, and one from, from Finland that I'll, I'll reference. So there was a famous experiment with something called minim, Mincome, so minimum income mm -hmm. uh, back in the 70s in a place called Dauphin in, in Manitoba in Canada. And a minimum income is instead of everybody getting it, you top up people to a certain level. So if yep. you're below this level, I'll give you money. But then if you're above it, you don't get anything else. Whereas with the basic income, we give it to everybody and then taxation takes it back from those who, who have more. Um, and the impacts in a short space of time in that community. So uh, frustratingly, the, the policy was carried out at the time. There was a real interest in basic income type policies in North America in the 70s. And indeed, Richard Nixon tried to introduce, not exactly the most progressive of, of presidents, mm -hmm. tried to introduce a, a, a basic income, negative income tax style policy to the US, uh, but was actually stopped by, by the Democrats at the time. Um, but in the, the Dolphin experiment, there were some really fascinating examples of, of where that impacted. So, for example, they saw that hospital admissions dropped during the period that people were receiving this, particularly around um, issues related to self-harm, suicide, to uh, depression and other mental health challenges. People were given a security that takes them away from some of those, those challenging areas. Uh, in some of the, the, the recent the, the analysis was only carried out years later by a fantastic uh, person um, in um in Canada and we, Evelyn Forge, and they found that the only people who didn't, it had an impact on the level of working, because that's quite often a critique of basic income. If we give you a basic income, everyone will stop working. Yeah. There were two groups uh, in the Dauphin experiments who worked less during the basic income. Now, one of those were new mothers. And it was because at the time, Canada didn't have any sort of um, maternity pay. Um, and so when mothers had babies, inevitably they were forced back to work quicker. A basic income, a minimum mm -hmm. income, allowed them to make choices about staying off work longer. Broadly one that people would, would agree is, is fairly positive yeah. in terms of reduce. The other one that was really fascinating was there was a reduction in uh, single unattached males were working less. And this was held up at the time as an example that it was a disastrous policy. You, <laughs> you know, anything that stops young men working. But actually when you looked into it, it was young men of school age secondary school age, who had been leaving earlier because their families needed them to be economically active to keep right. the family going. When yeah. you gave them enough of an income, they could stay at school longer and actually get more sustainable longer term jobs that are better for the future. So that showed a real, you know, a speedy impact that just the security of money could bring to people uh, around some of those, those aspects. Uh, more recently, there's been two big experiments, one in Ontario and Canada and one in Finland. Now, the Ontario uh, experiment, sadly, was cancelled just as it was about to start due to a change in political administration. Uh, amazing, amazing group that have been campaigning around it uh, over there and some fantastic gatherings of people and stories that come out of it. But again, what you saw, even with the brief period where it was uh, being set up and people were starting to receive some of the money, the choices that people made with that money were breathtaking, not surprising, but incredible. So there were stories of, you know, a, a mother who had had her children taken away from her because her housing was of not adequate standard. Now, she was left in the poor housing, but her yeah. children were taken away. So she had taken a basic income, knowing it was going to be there until of the, the, the frankly despicable political decisions taken by the, the administration there. Uh, you know, she knew she was going to have a basic income for two years, three years. So she had put a deposit down on a new flat so she could get her children back. There were stories about people, you know, buying things like winter coats for the first time, uh, you know, which living in Ontario is, is horrendous <laughs> in a position of not having it, looking to retrain so they could move into more sustainable jobs. 
really positive decisions that, that people made. Uh, and the Finnish experiment, which took place recently, now it was a very targeted experiment. It was only for people who were receiving unemployment benefit. Mm-hmm. And effectively, the, the group who participated, I think it was about 2,000 people, uh, they, they got the same money they already had, just the, the uh, requirements to and, and punishments were taken away. So you received the money, you could do whatever you wanted. Now, the things that came out of that that were really fascinating were uh, increased health and well-being amongst those who participated um, were receiving basic income. A, a small increase in, in the number working, although I, I would argue basic income is fundamentally not a, a kind of work uh, policy in that sense, but there was a small increase. But also a, an increase in the trust that people expressed for the state and for their communities and for others, that when they started to receive this money, their level of trust and belief in who they were working with increased. And I was at, I gave a talk the other day and, and the people on before me were talking about the fact that uh, there's not a recent report showing that, for example, intention to vote increased amongst those who participated because suddenly you were seen as valued by your mm-hmm. society and actually people respond to that by wanting to give back to it again. So, I mean, these are small scale examples in some way, but I think it starts to show that when you give people that security and that, that trust, when you say we believe you, mm. actually the majority of people choose to respond back to that with you as well. Yeah, the majority don't go out and buy alcohol. They don't go out and buy drugs. They spend it on necessities. Um, yeah, well, I mean, one of the examples quite often used is uh, Alaska has what they call the Alaskan Permanent Fund. So yeah. every year they take some of the profits from the exploitation of Alaska by oil and gas companies mm. and they pay it as a dividend to Alaskan residents. Now, again, evidence is shown there. So it's not a base game. You're not getting it on a regular basis. The, the value changes every year. But you know that every year at a certain point, you're going to receive a lump of sum of mm-hmm. money. And again, the evidence shows that people use that for paying college tuition fees for their kids, for paying off debts, for, yeah. you know, major pieces of work around their house or deposits for a new new property. You know, there is this presumption that everyone just has a party when it comes out once a year, which, and again, going back to, you know, I, I do strongly believe in, in the, the, for me, I, a basic income is universal, individual, and, and unconditional. They're kind of the yeah. key characteristics. You regularly get it. You know everybody gets it. Uh, and it's paid directly to you. It's not to a head of household. So you take away from that traditional you know, man as head of household receiving all the money. Um, but for me, the really critical and exciting bit is that unconditionality. It's the fact mm-hmm. we do not attach it. So do you know what? Also, people using that money to buy things that are considered luxuries, I don't think is a bad thing. You know, yeah. we did some work in Fife and we had some fantastic sessions, really humbling sessions with um, some residents uh, in Fife to um, talk about what they might see a, a basic income doing for them, for example. And I remember one of the ladies saying, oh, look, you don't have to include this in your report because I know it's not what you're, you know, you don't want to report them. She said, but if I had a basic income, one of the things I'd do is that every so often on a Friday night, I'd buy a Chinese takeaway for my family to share. Mm-hmm. And she said, I know that's not a good use of money. I said, well, why not? When so many of us are in a position where we're able to make that decision of that luxury. There was one of the Finnish participants said, since I had a basic income, now when I go into the supermarket, sometimes I'd buy the cheese I want and I like rather than just the one that's cheapest. Mm-hmm. And it's not about encouraging consumerism. It's, you know, obviously we're not encouraging unhealthy eating and, and binge drinking, but actually there's something around life being about joy and, and connection as well. And if people choose to use some of that money for I, I see that as a very positive thing. But the evidence shows, you know, when, when direct cash payments are made to people, so when it's, you know, not necessarily been basic income uh, experiments directly, but when there's been money given to people, they don't spend it on these undesirable products. A uh, guy standing around a huge pro- uh, uh, basic income experiment in India hmm. and it was opposed by the Indian government when it started it was actually supported by the United Nations because they said you're just going to have villages of people sitting around drunk all day and by the end of it they were saying actually we take it back this has been fantastic because people don't use it in that way so it's a very empowering um, space for people I think yeah um, yeah the evidence seems to be overwhelming and these studies they're not all necessarily new there's quite a few studies which have gone back 40 50 years so it's, for me, it's quite surprising. It, this information isn't almost readily known by a lot of people. Um, when yeah, it yeah, comes... Yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think it's because we've gone through... I mean, basic income is such an old idea. You know, mm. Thomas Paine 
spoke about this in, in his work around the time of the American Revolution. It's, you know, it's a key idea. It's, it's St. Thomas More and others. Martin Luther King, it was one of the policies that doesn't get picked up on as much, but it was one of the last yeah. things he wrote about before he was assassinated. So it's been around for a long time, but I think partly it's that it's had moments of, of popularity, but it's never got over the finishing line. And so it's kind of drifted away mm -hmm. again. Uh, and also, I think it's a policy that is, I, I would argue, has found its moment in the sense that where it responds, I think, most powerfully are to the challenges that we're seeing even more so now than we have done at other points so yeah. in terms of that precariousness and that insecurity. Uh, and therefore, I think it's maybe that we're having to kind of reconnect with some of that those previous findings because it's not, never seemed as relevant. It's been a niche interest. Mm -hmm. But now suddenly people are starting to see that doesn't mean there's not challenge and, and quite rightly in critique, but start to see how it can it can link up in a, in a stronger way. Yeah. So when it comes to trying to alleviate poverty and help the lower classes, there's been a long history of governments trying lots of different schemes. Why have governments tried pretty much everything apart from giving these people physical money? Well, we have tried it so mm. in the sense that we've had benefits that do involve giving people money and in many ways have been very similar so uh, you know in, in the uk child benefit um in many ways is very similar to a, to a basic income and actually was quite uh, powerful in the sense of usually being paid to to the mum and therefore offering a, a source of finance that, mm -hmm. that wasn't uh, controlled by the head of household you know in many ways yes there's a contributionary aspect of it, but a pension is an idea that's at a certain age everybody receives a certain level of money to to recognize where they, they don't work so we've we've done it in places i think it's partly a, a cultural thing that we we've tended although that welfare state we talked about after the second world war did have a lot of universalism to it yeah. so the nhs Yes, for example, education and, and others. Even in the early days, a lot of the universal aspects were watered down. So housing was always intended to be much more mixed. That you know you mm -hmm. would have council housing where doctors were living next to coal miners and, and so on. Uh, and that was one of the areas that was quite quickly kind of undermined and, and changed. So yeah. I think that we've had a tendency to focus on uh, you know just giving impacts to poor people and not to other people and, and seeing how that works. I think also we've seen um, traditionally, certainly here in Scotland, a very strong paternalism. So a very mm -hmm. strong idea that that the state, regardless actually of who's in power, knows best. Yeah. And actually these, these you know, people are, uh, you know, probably largely now have seen as they must be poor for some fault of their own. And so we need to fix it for them. And as I say, the problem is we've, we've had decades of trying to do that. And, and in many cases, it, it doesn't work. So I think it, it challenges power. It yeah. challenges the idea of, of what you're here for. I mean, I had someone say before, well, surely it's a terrible idea because what would you do about the, the folk currently working in the social security system and universal credit who would not be needed anymore to enforce these rules? And it's like, well, mm -hmm. do you know what? I'm, I'm sure actually maybe job centers would go back to being what they were intended to be, which is positive places to help yeah. people grow and develop and get jobs. And actually, I, I would guess a lot of job center employees probably would quite welcome that. So I think it's it, it represents a challenge to, to power and decision making that I think is quite significant. And that naturally causes uh, some concerns, I think, from from those in power. Uh, there was uh, I mentioned I, I did a session earlier this week and um, it was hosted by a, a leading basic income academic, Carl Redekris. And he said he wants to see a study on whether support for basic income amongst politicians mm -hmm. decreases the closer you get to being in a position to make decisions that could lead to a basic income. So right. is it one of those policies that's really good to support when you can't deliver it, when you're not in position? Yeah. But actually, if you had to pull the lever, would you suddenly find you, you aren't so keen? And I think there's, there's definitely an interesting aspect around that, about how we're, we're less, less happy to let go of power when it's our power that we're controlling. Yeah. Um I guess moving into a different direction, um, part of the reason why I became quite interested in UBI is I read a couple of books about AI and how society, the fabric of society, probably is going to change quite a lot in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Are there, which industries, are there any industries that come to mind which you think are in big trouble where a UBI might even be essential? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I would say when you look at, at where support for UBI in, say, America has come from, traditionally, mm -hmm. maybe less so now, but certainly over the last years, it's been tended to be pushed by kind of tech entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, and a lot, it's very much been driven by that fear of AI and automation. 
Yeah. Um, whereas I think in Scotland, it's tended to be pushed more from kind of social justice, social right. agency perspective. Yeah. Uh, and for me, the reality is that the two have to come together. Yeah. Because actually, the the impacts of AI and, and automation, much of which will be positive, but you know, there will also be significant disruption. Now is our time to get ahead of that. You know, when mm -hmm. we've had previous industrial uh, disruption, we've waited or we've been caught out or we've let communities suffer through that. Yeah. Uh, you know, a basic income is our chance to get ahead of the curve and, and protect some. And there's no doubting that, you know, um, there are there are significant, there are industries that will be significantly impacted. The US example that's often used is um, long distance truck driving, yeah. which last time I saw the stats was still the main source of employment for white men in something like 30 of the US states. You know, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a significant industry uh, and also it's, it's almost a significant way of life in terms of, of participation. Now, as an industry that could very quickly be automated, uh, you know, with driverless vehicles, particularly in the American context where many of them are driving, you know, huge distances along straight roads. Yeah. Um, you know, you can see how that very quickly could be a significant source of job losses for part of the population who maybe would struggle to move into other sectors. Um, but interestingly, alongside um, the, the trucks themselves, actually you can automate most of the, um, the kind of control of the, the whole system as well. So Uber, we're moving into um, actually managing, you know, kind of uh, long distance haulage because actually mm -hmm. you don't need a hundred staff anymore. You can run it with algorithms and, and so on. I think what's going to be really disruptive about AI and automation and, and the kind of new industrial revolution that we're seeing is I think it will impact far wider across society and, and jobs than maybe <laughs> other industrial revolutions that have been more focused on you know heavy industry losing yeah. out actually for lots of society we didn't really get affected therefore it was easier to ignore those communities that, that were impacted you know you can look at significant parts of the legal profession mm. uh, and and say it would be a lot cheaper and more efficient to have uh, you know an, an ai running that you can look at aspects within medicine where ai can can be brought in and, and new robotics and, and other areas now, again, people who are lawyers and doctors tend to be in a much stronger, more resilient economic, social, educational perspective to move into other options or to seize the opportunities that AI offers. But mm -hmm. I think the disruption will be more widespread uh, and therefore I think it will, it will have an impact. For me, where I've been concerned with some of the focus around uh, AI is, uh, or, or that is the kind of motivation, is that there's been, a, particularly in the US, a, a kind of idea of there's going to be no work in future. Yeah. You know, robots and AI are going to take over the world and, and we're all going to be sitting around bored. And if anything, you know, uh, someone like Elon Musk, who, you know, uh, always comes across a bit like a bad Bond villain, you know, I think he's aware that he's introducing ideas and, and uh, products that are going to take away people's jobs and there may be a negative backlash. So a basic income is almost a bit of a, a kind of way of keeping people from your door with pitchforks. Yeah. I don't believe that we'll get to a stage where, you know, work doesn't exist. And yeah. I don't think we want to. I think good work is is an important part of life but it's yeah. expanding out what we we conceptualize work as it's recognizing caring and volunteering and activism and, and everything else mm -hmm. uh, and so i think it there was an element where a time where basic income was being attacked to some sort of either utopian or kind of negative idea you know aspects of the labor party in the uk have been quite opposed to basic income because it's some you know it's going to take away the dignity of work and you know yeah we need work to, to make our lives functional. Problem is that quite often the jobs they're talking about lack any sort of dignity anyway. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I believe in the dignity of work, but we have to make sure it, it's a genuine thing. So, you know, I think AI is going to be a real driver. I think we're not prepared enough in Scotland and the UK at this stage yeah. to write it. Um, I think it's going to have significant impacts. There was a study that showed that the introduction of driverless vehicles in Scotland would impact something like 60% of the economy. Yeah. And that's because you go, all right, taxi drivers, that's going to be a nightmare for them. But actually, you're not thinking about the impacts it has on so many other different, you know, if commuting patterns change, like we saw with the, the pandemic, it's, you know, the, the the shops that shut, or if we're having people drive us, do we not stop places on routes? Yeah. So I think there's going to be significant impacts from it. I think it can be really positive. There's a cartoon does the rounds on, on the web a lot, and it's the two pictures, and it's a guy outside, a uh, figure outside a, a factory, Mm -hmm. And the first one, he's despondent, and it says, the robots have taken my job. And then the second one, he's, he's jumping, and it says, hooray, the robots have taken my job. <laughs> and he's off to, to do exciting things. So, yeah, yeah I think I think it's going to be interesting to see where that, that goes. And I think, it, for me, the critical bit is 
we should be trying to get ahead of that now yeah. so that we don't allow communities to lose out in that. But the problem is too often we, we wait to be reactive. <clears throat> yeah. Do you think government are actually aware of this? Because especially in democracies, politicians are so short term. They always think about two, three, four years ahead. Whereas this is almost a long game, which is probably going to hit us a lot sooner than politicians think, actually. Um, yeah. Does that concern you? Oh, I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in and supporter of democracy, but, you know, electoral cycles are one of the biggest challenges we face. You know, it's, yeah. it's been shown over and over that politicians vastly overestimate their ability to make a difference in the short <laughs> term and vastly underestimate their, their ability to make a difference in the yeah. long term. I think they're they're trying. I mean, in Scotland, there's there's growing focus. There's some organisations doing some really good work around uh, artificial intelligence and, and looking at what that that might uh, envisage. I think one of the things in Scotland certainly that's that's really important is the framing of what we call the just transition. Mm-hmm. So uh, my organisation is doing some work with Scottish government just now around the energy sector. Now, obviously, there's going to be significant impacts, not necessarily specifically from AI, but from uh, dealing with the climate emergency, you know, yeah. oil and gas and, and uh, non-renewable sources. So how do you transition to the energy sector we need to have? Mm-hmm. Do that in a way that is really successful for Scotland and for businesses and for people, but doesn't leave people behind. And I yeah. think that framing, I think, is a really important one. And we're starting to see it take off elsewhere. I mean, I, I thought it was really fascinating. Um, I think just before the last US presidential elections, I think it was the, the union of, of coal miners in Pennsylvania and in, in the US who had been very opposed to most talk of, of climate change because uh, you know it, it would have significant impact on their, their jobs. We're saying, look, we recognize our industry isn't sustainable and needs to change, mm-hmm. but you have to help us change with you. Yeah, I think one of the things that concerns me with, uh, with politicians, with society, with media, is that it's very easy for us if we do suddenly get momentum for change, which is good. We need it. You know, we're facing a, a, yeah. a huge emergency. It can be very easy to blame the wrong people. Yeah. So you know, it's it's these miners who won't let go of their jobs. They should just accept the fact that it's a dirty industry. Well, yes, yeah. but it's paying their bills and keeping their children fed. Uh, we had an event a, week, a few years ago with uh, Sandrine Dixon de Clay, who's co-president of the Club of Rome, and she talked about that one of the biggest challenges we face just now is finding a way to bring together, and this is generalising wildly, but on one hand, young people who are trying to survive the century, yeah. and people, she used the example of the Gilles Jean movement in, in France, who are trying to survive the week because yeah. they don't know where their jobs and their money are going to come from. And again, it comes back to me why basic income is so important. Economic insecurity, poverty, lack of money, fear of your future reduces your mental bandwidth. You know, mm-hmm. studies upon study upon study have shown this. You are not, you know, largely able to look to the future because you don't know what's happening tomorrow. So when we're asking people to respond to huge technological change, when we're asking people to make changes to their, their lives and expectations because we face an existential crisis of the climate emergency, when we're asking changes around migration and everything else, but we don't give people the security and the time to make those changes, then yeah. it, you no wonder that people resist. And yet what we do is we, you know, tire them as bags of deplorables and, and blame <laughs> them for what's going on. So that's where I, I see a real concern Yeah, um, because you also get the flip side of there's a short term political game. You know, Trump did it in, in 2016. You say, yeah. I'll bring coal back to people who have no jobs. They knew he wasn't going to bring coal back. He knew certainly he wasn't going to bring coal back. But at least yeah. someone was saying, I recognize you've lost something here. And I think that's where there's, you know, the kind of the dangers of populism. I know you've, you've explored some of this in your, your previous sessions. I think there's a real risk of when people feel they've got no space, no security and nothing to lose. Yeah. That's a very dangerous combination. And I think a basic income doesn't solve all that by any stretch of the imagination, but could give a foundational security to allow us to, to hear some of those losses and, and genuine pain that we should be listening to. Yeah, that was Hillary Clinton's um, Achilles Hill calling um, all the Trump supporters deplorables. I mean, was- yeah, I, I mean, it, the problem is that you can understand why, why someone would say it in those positions and, and yeah. feel some of these things, but it does just fall into that route of, it also creates scapegoats who don't reflect actually, you know, Trump won because of, frankly, richer white folk and weirdly, particularly richer white women who voted <laughs> for him. Because that's the joys of a secret ballot, as you can yep. vote for people who you shouldn't do in, in public. 
Um, and actually, by by reducing everything down to it's just either neo Nazis or you know stupid poor people, um, it, it it doesn't give you that space. We've seen it with yeah. Brexit. You know, as soon as we kind of dismiss these communities, you know, Cornwall, how could Cornwall not vote in favour of the EU when it's received so much money? Well, how has that been portrayed to people? How do they understand what that is? Has it yeah. felt patronising? Do they understand where the money comes from? It's that kind of lack of, of awareness. And it's where I think, part of the reason I think basic income has moved so swiftly in, in Scotland and across the UK and many parts of the world, but, but certainly my experience in, in what we've, we've seen in Scotland is because it's been driven by community groups um, and activists by academics by where there's been political involvement it's been local government and it's not really been party political yeah. so this has been people going we have challenges here's an idea we want to shape it mm -hmm. and we've given people too much of, of politics for me just now is is instantly instant binary decisions so here's an idea here's basic income do you like it or do you not like it yeah make a choice now right you like it you sit over there with people who like it i'll sit over here with ones who don't we'll never talk again what we've tried to do is say to people, play with the idea. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's easier for me in Scotland because generally we find that the, when you go into an, an audience, they're generally quite positive overall towards basic income. But what I say to the people who support basic income, fantastic. But where are the risk points? Where are the challenges that could, mm. could create a basic income that was very different? Um, you know, I, I pride myself on my non-partisan stance. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a member of any political party. But, you know, I, if someone once said to me, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the, the conservative politician, apparently behind closed doors, is maybe slightly more interested in basic income than people would think he would be. I, I would be very surprised to see a version of basic income that Jacob Rees-Mogg would propose that would be one that <laughs> chimed with what I would be looking at. Because you could yeah. create a really libertarian basic income in the UK that said, we'll give you a really good basic income, but we'll scrap the NHS at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so it's giving people the same thing. Wait, you like this idea? Great. But where are the risks? What are the other policies we need to make this successful? You know, you can't introduce a basic income without uh, some sort of living wage because yeah. otherwise employers would just cut wages by the income. You can't introduce mm -hmm. some sort of control around rent and, and mortgages because otherwise they'll just raise your mortgage by the, the money. How do you, so, you know, you support it. Great. How do we make it the best policy it could be? If you don't support it or you're not sure, play with the idea. You know, quite often we'll find people will say, well, I don't like basic income because the guy down the road for me would spend it all on boots. You know, yeah. he would go straight to the pub. Now, some people will because people have problems and they have decisions and, and, and that's what happens. Funnily, we never say that about ourselves. So, you know, we don't say I'll run down the pub and spend it all, but, you know, these other people would do. Yeah. But also, it's amazing how often when you say to someone who says that, but they play with it, they go, well, it doesn't take away that they're concerned about that person or that part of society. But they then go... But actually, my cousin's always wanted to open her own business and has never had the money or the security to do so. Or actually, I've always thought about retraining. And you give them that space. It doesn't stop them going, I have concerns, which are really important. But it allows them to say it can be a bit more nuanced. You can yeah. have you can like bits of it. You can have concerns and, and bring those together. And I think that, again, allows us to push back about, uh, against some of the, you know, to, to misquote the old saying, no policy survives contact with politicians rather than the enemy. You know, they, they will always be, you know, adaptations and compromises yeah. and, and everything else. But I think when you have public involvement and civic involvement and wider community involvement, it, it provides a pressure that maybe keeps some of that discussion a bit more honest and, and real. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting points. Um, when it comes to administering UBI or a basic income, do you think it should be government or do you think it should be a third party? Because the worry I have is if governments are involved in administering basic income, there's potential for politicians to essentially abuse it, manipulate it, be opportunistic and say, vote for me if I increase it. If I increase UBI by 15 percent, come vote for me. Yeah, it's those opportunistic politicians and people with the wrong motives. Who could potentially tamper with this basic income system? Yeah, which is really funny because so I, I I completely hear where you're coming from, and it's one I've been thinking about more recently. And I'll come back to why I think there is certainly a, a case to be made for having a kind of independent body. Yeah, but it's funny that it gets raised with that. So these these politicians would say, "I'm going to raise the basic income," and and that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But these are the same politicians who'll be saying, "I'll cut your tax rate," or "I'll raise taxes on on these people." 
yeah. or he'll be saying vote for me because I'll put more money into the health system. So it's not actually any different from any other policy that politicians yeah. have and, and that's how they, they function. So in some ways, a politician saying, I'm going to raise your basic income, if it's subject to the appropriate scrutiny around how they're going to pay for that and what impacts it's going to have, yeah. isn't any different from any other political perspective. Where I do think there's a, a case, and I think maybe more work needs done on this for a kind of independent body, I think is partly around keeping it safe. So where my concern mm -hmm. less than politicians saying I'm going to raise it by 10%, well, I'll raise it by 15%, is A, politicians not raising it at all. So, you know, for it to remain valid, there's going to be has some, some sort of link to inflation and, you know, yeah. cost of living rises and everything. So having an independent body do that, you could argue, could make it a more rational data-driven process rather than a party political opportunistic one. So I think there's yeah. something around that. Where I have a concern more about politicians is the idea of, you know, someone saying, well, vote for me because what I'll do is I'll remove it from these people. Yeah. Um, and the problem with any of these systems is it's quite quick to undermine them. Um, mm -hmm. if you, so on one hand, if you get basic income in, it would very quickly, I think, become a very popular part of society and people would, would want it there. We've seen that support the NHS. However, you can start to pull bits of it away. You know, I mentioned child benefits. That was universal. And now it's a, a situation where it's taken away from hired earners. Is that fundamentally critical to the the base to the, the child benefit policy? Not necessarily, but it starts to change the conceptualization. Yeah. You know, people then go, oh, this is just for poorer people. And usually guys standing talked about the fact that, you know, benefits for poor people are usually poor benefits. And they're mm -hmm. usually the first ones that are up for cutting if you go into to an election. So I think there's a case certainly for that kind of almost protective nature. Yeah. or the basic income for there to for there to be kind of an independent body that can link it to to data to reality it can be analyzing the impacts it has and it would also give it an opportunity and i, I say this this needs more work so i'm not quite sure how you'd, you'd manage it but things like for example when we hit the covid19 pandemic had we had a basic income in place it would be much easier to administer and to be able to raise that for example because we were in extenuating circumstances so you could have said look you're getting a basic income we're going to increase that for a year because we know people are not working whereas yeah. we had the huge issue of trying to get a furlough system into place and, and people falling through the cracks and so on so uh yeah i, I long-winded way of saying I, I think there's not i think there's work to be done there around that that need for protecting and, and shaping the, the basic income yeah what what would you say to the skeptics who question the funding of how, how we would fund a basic income? I, I think it's a really important question. Um, I think there's a few things that one of the frustrations we have with, with basic income, uh, and this comes from supporters of basic income uh, as much as from, from opponents, yeah. is for me, it's an old idea, but it's, it's this new social contract for the 21st century. It's responding to these challenges and opportunities of a world and technology that's, that's changing. Yeah. And then we sit down and go, well, let's pay for it the way we've functioned our economy all the time. So we'll, we'll just look at, you know, income tax and, and that's the answer. Uh, and that doesn't make sense to me. We're using 20th century taxation for 21st century um, functioning. To me, it's about starting to look at the wider remits that are out there. So I think, and, and don't get me wrong, this is a, a challenging space and I don't know quite how we, we deliver it at this point. Mm -hmm. I would argue that possibly the, the biggest and most um, valuable resource in the world just now is data. Uh, yeah. and yet the vast majority of that flows from us directly into private pockets. Now, yeah. to be able to tap into that as a source of taxation to pay towards a, a basic income, I think could be a, a really important space. It's about finding those new streams. Um, you know, we, we had a discussion and it's funny, it was uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jürgen Vischlera, who's a, a leading basic income academic, kind of half said it as a joke, but actually it's becoming more and more relevant as he said, mm. well, people talk about using environmental taxes. So, you know, tax the heaviest polluters and use that to pay for basic income. But obviously the hope with car, you know, carbon tax or, or pollution tax is that that would drop because people yeah. stop doing it. And he said, well, you know, tax legalized marijuana and tax profits in marijuana. Um, because actually you've got a pretty steady growth industry there. Now suddenly we're in a position where Canada and, you know, several states in the U S and other countries, it's a big booming industry you know yeah i think it's looking at land value taxation it's looking at new approaches to to money but also for me you have to be able to pay for policies but basic income is also an investment in the future yeah. it's not just a, a, a let's pay something here we, we've we're, we're putting down money it's about going back to what you're saying about you know longer term impacts we are spending money now to invest in our mm -hmm. 
that will also pay dividends in, in future. So if we have those impacts on the healthcare system, then the savings from that will be significant. If we yeah. see new businesses created, then the entrepreneurial impact will be significant yeah. to the economy. If we see, you know, better attainment in, in school, if we see, you know, less need for other uh, benefits and so on, then I think we can see a lot of, of impacts there. I think the other thing, one that we've never been very good at clarifying, so I, I remember giving a talk in Glasgow once, and you know when, uh, back in the good old days when we were all together in person, <laughs> I, you know when you give a talk and you realise it's going really badly and you can't quite put your, your finger on it, and that the atmosphere in the room just got icier and icier and yeah. you know arms were getting folded and oof, <laughs> I, I was worried I was going to make it out and it was it was a talk to on basic income to to disability charities in, in Glasgow and when we got to questions and answers at the end because I was thinking this is a, an audience where hopefully there's a lot of, of potential that this could be positive people were were furious about the idea and the reason they were furious quite rightly was because I had talked about one of the ways you pay towards basic income is you roll in a lot of the existing benefit system because you yeah. don't need it anymore <laughs> you don't roll in disability support because yeah. disability support is individual, it's not societal. And the problem was when I talked about it, the presumption quite rightly that they took from it was that you were rolling in disability support as well. And they were saying, well, how can you expect us with you know, with challenges to, to living in the world that are not going to be addressed mm-hmm. to have less money? As soon as you said, actually, no, disability is separate and would be kept alongside and on top of a basic income. There was a lot of positivity around the, the benefits. Yeah. Right? So I, you know, it's important to recognize that that's a separate area. The, the big area of benefits that we really struggle with is housing benefit yeah. because the housing market, you know, the UK is a complete joke. To introduce a national basic income that covered housing benefit for London and the Southeast would either mean that the rest of the country would all be absolutely loaded or it would be so low that it just wouldn't be worthwhile. Yeah. Even in Scotland, compare Edinburgh to, to Glasgow, you know, it's, it's very difficult. So yeah. most models have kept housing benefits still out, which is really frustrating because ultimately you would want it uh, kind of brought into there. But I think, you know, it's it's about these new methods of payment. It's about finding new ways to, to uh, raise revenue in the 21st century and actually challenging ourselves to, to think about these new opportunities. Yeah, there's um, a really strong US advocate, a proponent, Andrew Yang. He's really positive about UBI. And one of the things he proposes is a 10% VAT. Here in the West, here in Europe, we have 20%. In America, we don't have it. He proposes having a 10% VAT, which would be more than sufficient to cover the costs of a basic income. And he argues that the gains from entrepreneurship, startups, all, all the advantages of a basic income system will significantly lift society and massively you know overlook for any potential negatives of a, of a basic income system absolutely i mean and, and andrew's done a fantastic job of, of um really pushing basic yeah. income you know certainly working with scott santons as well to the, the forefront of debate in, in the us and you know now that you've got major groups like the mayors for guaranteed income that's bringing yeah. lots of cities together i think you know some really exciting space within and, and yeah andrew uh, andrew's done a, a great job so Shane, more recently he's kind of talking less about basic income than he, than he used to but yeah. um uh, yeah no and obviously he's taking on um, bipartisan politics instead yeah. but um yeah no, i think I, I think it's it's a really powerful framing and yes we already have the VAT and, and there's arguments about VAT to how much of a progressive taxation system it is and, and so on. But obviously I think within a US system, it's a very sensible approach in terms yeah. of impact. Um, but yeah, it's about, I think it's about challenges. It goes back to what I said at the beginning in a sense, even if basic income wasn't the answer or what I suspect is more likely is partial steps towards a universal basic income. So I can, yeah. I can imagine us getting basic income for some people sooner than getting a basic income for everybody but if yeah. you start to link those together and again you know there's debates within the basic income movement some are much more of the solar or nothing you know I'm, I'm i'm more of a i suppose an incrementalist in that sense but you know you look at somewhere like canada canada has about 40 basic incomes just now it's just that they're all targeted at different groups and yeah. actually it'd be far easier more efficient to just join them all together <laughs> um but i think going back to that idea of basic income even if it wasn't the answer those questions about well, where are we going to make money for future? You yeah. know, how do we grow the economy in a sustainable way that's not exploiting either people or the planet, mm-hmm. but can still, you know, bring the benefits that that um, success can can bring to communities? How do we do that by looking at new taxation systems? Um, yeah. And I think you know, finding ways it's in basic income. You know, actually, they can help to. 
you know, bring some of that in. Uh, you know, again, I have my cynicism about some of them, but I think it's 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 a space certainly that's that's open for debate in that sense. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I think Andrew Yang's a very uh, very interesting uh, figure in this space. Um, I'm conscious of your time, so one last question to wrap up: Are there any politicians, any political parties in the West or in any other countries which you think um, are giving us hope or? show some sign of progression when it comes to implementing a basic income? Well, I mean, in Scotland, um, so at the last Scottish parliamentary elections uh, last year, um, they had the first leaders debate um, mm -hmm. for the main political parties. And I deliberately decided not to watch it for my own health and well-being. <laughs> and uh, I was cooking dinner and my phone suddenly started going crazy. And it was people tweeting me going, oh, you must be loving the debate because they got asked a yeah. question about basic income. And four out of the five main party leaders said that they supported basic income. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland, has been is now a very um, prominent and public supporter and proponent of basic income. She described it as a policy whose time has come and uh, that she would deliver in Scotland if she could. She can't uh, yeah. under the English assessment. So, I mean, we're in Scotland, we're in a very good political position in that sense. Even the, the, the one party who said they didn't support it, that was uh, that discussion was the Conservative Party. Yeah. And actually, they, they are very much open to conversations around it in a way that they weren't even three, four years ago. So yeah. uh, Scotland has a lot of positivity. Our challenge is we don't have the powers or the, the, the fiscal opportunities to deliver it. So yeah. therefore, it's... I think it will partly be built into any future discussion around independence in mm -hmm. Scotland. You know, could that be a foundation to a new independent Scotland? Yeah. Um, I think Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales, is really uh, fantastic around it as well. He's introducing a, a new pilot looking for young people leaving the care system that looks. Hello. Participate. So I think Mark's fantastic. We had the, um, sorry, we lost you there. Sorry, yeah, I think the connection just went. Sorry, carry on. Uh, I don't know where you got to in terms of. Uh, I think I just lost about 30, 20 seconds. Uh, so I, I'm saying Nicola Sturgeon's, uh, you know, very big supporter, and, and I think it will come into the independence debate in Scotland yeah. uh, if that comes up again. Uh, Mark Drake for the First Minister of Wales uh, is yeah. a very long-standing, prominent supporter. I think Mark's fantastic, and um, he's about to launch a new pilot looking at direct cash payments to young people leaving the care system. Yeah. Uh, and I think what's really exciting there is he the payment is at quite a high level um, because the Welsh government is giving extra money from their budget because they mm -hmm. know that the young people will not be given some of the UK benefits. Yeah. And so they're supplementing to make sure they don't miss out. And I think that's that shows that devolved administrations can still be doing things, even if they can't deliver the, the actual goal just now. Yeah. Uh, so they're both both uh, exciting opportunities. A lot of the city leaders in in, uh, in England are trying to push things. Andy Burnham's been, been a, yeah. a good supporter. Uh, and yeah, across the world, I mean, we're seeing there's still a lot of interest in Canada. A lot of US cities really started pushing this. And big cities now, you know, LA is looking at it, Chicago, you know, uh, big, big, uh, big areas to, to introduce. So I'm I'm optimistic we've got a real chance there to, to make change. I don't think it's easy. I think mm -hmm. on one hand, the pandemic probably pushed the debate forward by about five years because suddenly yeah. we could see how that would have benefited so many people and we could see the failings in the system. But it also means we're now in a transition out of COVID phase where people are scrabbling. It's a bit like people not having the security to think long term. We're kind of trying to scrabble out of this. But uh, I think, you know, when you start to see people like the, the director general of the UN has said it's a policy that's inevitable. Uh, I've been doing some work recently with a group who are, are providing some thought based on Pope Francis from the, the mm -hmm. Catholic Church has been talking about basic income as a, as a great idea. So, you know, I think there's a real growing energy around it. And I think now's the time to really start you know, joining that together and seeing how we can make really positive impact on a, a huge number of people by introducing it. Yeah, I agree. I'm in the same boat as you. I'm definitely optimistic about it. There's definitely more debate and more conversation happening around this topic of basic income. And I can only see that increasing, really. Um, Jamie, thanks for joining me tonight. Um, I'm going to leave a link down below to your TED Talk because I thought it was excellent. I recommend Fantastic. anyone uh, who's watched this podcast to go ahead and watch the TEDx talk because it's really great. 
I'll send you a link as well to last year we had the uh, the World Basic Income Congress was in Glasgow. Yeah. Uh, it was online, which was a shame because we would have had a good party in the city. But <laughs> it meant that A, we had the highest number of attendees ever um, for, for a World Congress, well over a thousand. But also we were able to record every session. So I'll send you the link that you hopefully can share as well that uh, people might want to watch some of the talks awesome. and contributions there, including both First Ministers of Wales and uh, Scotland as well. Of course, I'll check that out. I'll stick it in the link. I'll stick a link in the description down below as well. Fantastic.